Well, hello there. Welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I am the curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this program, we're covering the dates of March 7th through March 13th. We're going to start by talking about that great sea serpent constellation known as Hydra that is now emerging out of the eastern part of the sky. Then we'll look high up and watch the moon move through some of these beautiful wintertime stars this week. Then we'll talk about the early morning again as we watch Saturn rise to position that you may be able to see in these coming mornings. So let's get to it. If you happen to be taking a look at the east and southeast about an hour or two after sunset, you may have already noticed the great spring stars of Leo the Lion that's been getting higher and higher. We talked recently about this constellation and the mythology behind it, but if you have a chance to look in this area and you look a little bit south of Leo, you may catch a glimpse of a constellation that is really big but lesser known and probably because it's a little harder to see, but it's famous nonetheless. And that is a giant sea serpent called Hydra. And I'll turn on Hydra here. It's starting to become a great time of year to see Hydra, especially his head and the rest of his body that are starting to rise a little bit earlier right now. And so to see the entire constellation of Hydra, because it's one of the largest in the sky of any that you can see from Earth, you got to stay up a little bit later and you can see how far this meandering constellation stretches across the winter and, of course, springtime sky. And there you see it there. All right, so now that we have a better view of it, the part that I normally see, even though it's not the brightest part of the constellation, are the stars of the head that you find right up here. It almost makes a head-like shape, not too, too far away from the head of Leo, which looks like a hook here, and the star called Procyon. That's right here. That is the star that's inside the small dog known as Canis Minor. So in between Canis Minor and the head of Leo, you may see the head of Hydra, the sea serpent or the sea snake. And then the rest of the body you find here. Now these stars are a lot dimmer. So you usually need a star chart or maybe a stargazing app to maybe locate some of these lesser known and dimmer stars. There is one star in particular that's quite nice inside of it and it's the brightest star in the constellation. It's called Alphard, which you find right there. And one way to find Alphard if you don't notice it or can't find it easily is you can actually use two of the stars in Leo right here. And I'll turn on the lines of Leo so you can just see that a little bit better. These two stars in particular, so this one is called Algeba or Algeba, and the brightest star in Leo, Regulus, right there. You can take those two and you can kind of connect them. And if you sort of follow a line between those two stars, a little bit to the south and southwest that may lead you to the star Alphard that we find right there. And this star Alphard is quite noticeable in this area because there's not a whole bunch of bright stars here. So this star kind of shines on its own and you'll notice it's reddish color. This is a well-known red giant star that's about 50 times bigger than our sun and about 177 light years away. So it's quite big and actually a bright star, but it's a decent distance away from us, which then kind of makes it just a little bit dimmer than it normally would be if it were closer. But it has a beautiful kind of amber reddish glow at the heart, or sometimes we say it's at the backbone of this giant sea serpent. And Alfard is an Arabic name and originally meant the individual because the star that's kind of by itself in this area, not a lot of bright stars as I mentioned, and it seems like one individual bright star in this area so it's been given that name and all of these stars that are part of hydra if you find them are part of this massive creature this kind of scary creature that has a well-known story behind it that involves hercules hercules had to complete these 12 labors to clear his name of past wrongdoings we mentioned recently that his first labor was to defeat the nemean lion that is now leo that was one that he fought he wrestled it to the ground and defeated the lion but his second labor was to defeat this sea serpent it wasn't just any sea creature this was a terrifying monster that was inhabiting a lake called Lake Lerna. So this is also known as the Lernian Hydra. And from these ancient stories of Greek and Roman mythology, this was the offspring of two scary monster-like creatures known as Typhon and Echidna. And one of their offspring was this giant sea serpent. It turns out that if you cut one head of the sea serpent off, 
two more would grow, so it became a very tough creature to fight. And the warrior Hercules was tasked with defeating this sea serpent. So he brings along his nephew Iolius, and they start fighting the sea serpent. They cut off a head, and to their bewilderment, they see two more grow back. They continue cutting until we have this scary multi-headed creature, the Hydra, and became a formidable beast to overcome. And these two, Hercules and Iolius, came up with a technique that if Iolius would take a hot torch and burn each head that was cut off by Hercules, they could stop the growing. They would basically cauterize the wound, stop the growth of a head, and they found that to be a successful tactic. They started doing that over and over again until one head remained. And apparently Hera, the wife of Zeus, who sent out the snake into the world, she did not like Hercules because he was the love child of Zeus, her husband, and another woman. So she did not want Hercules to win this battle. So in an act of desperation, Hera actually brings out another creature to join forces with Hydra. And this creature is actually nearby in between the constellations of Leo and Gemini. A not very bright constellation, but one that's part of the zodiac known as Cancer the Crab. And Cancer is a tough constellation to see, but it's near the head of Hydra. So Cancer joined the fight, but was easily destroyed and beaten by Hercules. And once Cancer was beaten, this sea serpent had one more head to defeat. So instead of cutting it off, Hercules and Iolius took a big rock and smashed Hydra's head to win the battle and complete the second labor. So the sea serpent is famously known for one of the great battles of Hercules. Now all throughout this week, we're gonna find the moon being part of our evening sky and you're gonna see it start in a waxing crescent phase and moving through some of those winter constellations that are still very high in the sky. So here on March 7th, this is Monday night, what we're finding here is a thin crescent moon still getting close to the constellation of Taurus the Bull, which you find right here. We'll turn on the lines of Taurus. And as we move through these next few days, we'll kind of watch as the moon then enters into Taurus, getting fairly close to the Pleiades star cluster that we find there. Continuing in its waxing phases, we move on to the ninth here, the 10th, where we get pretty close to a half phase or first quarter moon. And by the 11th and 12th, where we find the moon entering into its waxing gibbous phases inside of the Gemini twins. Of course, we can find Orion the Hunter underneath here and his two dogs, the brightest star Sirius there. Moving on to the 13th, there we have an even larger waxing gibbous moon actually getting not too far away from Leo the Lion's head right here and also the head of Hydra that we just mentioned there. Now, one question I get asked at times, especially at this time of the year, is why is the moon so high in the sky right now? And that's a great question, because if you watch the moon carefully throughout the year, you notice that you see it at different altitudes when it's going through its phases. It's not always charting such a high course across the sky. And that's all due to Earth's tilt. What's interesting about Earth's tilt is not only does it affect the angle that the sun charts across the sky, but also the angle of the moon and their opposites. So as you may know, in the wintertime, at least for us here in the Northern Hemisphere, Earth is generally tilted away from the sun. And if that's the case, when Earth rotates around back into the nighttime, that means it's tilted towards the night part of the sky, if that makes sense, the opposite side. So when the moon makes its way to the night side of our sky, that means that Earth in the wintertime is tilted towards the moon, which places the moon at a higher angle or altitude in the sky versus our summertime. And in the summer, we are tilted towards the sun. So opposite of that, when the moon is on the night side, on the opposite side of that tilt, that means that Earth is then tilted away from the moon, which puts the moon at a lower altitude in the sky as it charts a course across the star field. So to understand that a little bit more, I'm gonna turn on what's called the altitude and azimuth grid, which also places a point in the sky, the highest point called the zenith at the very top that we see here. And so this can kind of show us sort of the path or at least the altitude of the moon throughout the year and how that changes. What we can also do is put up a date and time window so we can kind of see what time of year it is. And so again, right now we're here in March, still technically in the winter time, but we're near the end of it. And you can see the moon very high in relation to this grid. And again, here's the zenith. So that's the very tippy top of the night sky at any moment. 
So if we go through here, I'm gonna move very quickly here. You're gonna watch the moon change its position up and down relative to this grid. So you'll see how that works as we move pretty quickly here. And what we're gonna do is turn on the ecliptic line, sort of the path that the moon makes in the sky, but pay attention to the moon as we move very quickly day to day and watch where the moon is located throughout the year. We're now getting closer to the summertime and look where the moon is charting a path in the sky. It's a little bit lower because at that time of year, Earth is tilted away from the moon and the nighttime side of the sky, putting the moon at a lower angle. Let's continue on moving through summer, back into fall and look how the moon's getting higher as we go through the fall and back into winter time again. There you go. And we're moving through January here and February where the moon still charts a very high course through the sky getting near that zenith and back to March where it's still very high in the sky for next year just as it usually is at this time. So you can see that difference sort of play out throughout the year just the same as you see the sun's altitude above the horizon change as we move around the sun throughout the year. As we've been paying attention to the early morning before sunrise, we've been watching those planets gather in this area. It's been a great place to look out for some of our neighborly planets. And Venus and Mars are still shining highest right now. There's Venus, and you see Mars just below it and to the right. But what's great right now is Saturn is finally getting to position, making it easier and easier to see right now. If you look low in the east here, it's still pretty low. We can find Mercury that is now probably too close to the sun to see at the moment, but here we find Saturn there rising a little bit higher. And as we go from morning to morning, we'll actually find it a little higher a little bit earlier on as we move through the week here. And of course, as we move even more into March, you'll see it for a greater period of time before the sun rises. And one thing about an outer planet like Saturn is it doesn't dip above and below the sun quickly like Venus and Mercury do because Saturn lies so far from the sun. So Saturn charts a very slow course across the sky. And once it's in the morning, it will stay in the morning through a good part of the year until eventually enters our evening sky for the last half of the year. And I just wanna mention a quick note here at the end that by Sunday, March 13th, the end of the week, we're going to begin daylight saving time. So two in the morning, we set our clocks forward an hour for many folks around the world, especially here in North America. And I wanna mention this because after that, it will be getting darker later. So you have to wait a little bit longer for the stars to appear. And also the morning will change as well. It will stay darker for longer in the morning since everything shifts an hour ahead. Sadly, we do lose an hour of sleep. But again, just wanted to mention how this changes our observing times in the sky. Hey, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in once again. And if you're in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences. We have many awesome exhibits and displays that you can check out. It's wonderful. And of course, we have our Loman Planetarium where we're running shows daily. If you want any more information about anything we're doing in the museum, including the planetarium, please check out our website. With that, we hope to see you back here again. Take care, and of course, happy stargazing. <laughs>